And hello, we are back for session one, right? Session one, okay. <laughs> I can't remember how long we played this and how much. Uh, anyway, we did a session zero for Highcaster. This is um, going to be the first session of the story. So we have our characters already. We even have kind of a template for what we're going to be doing next. So uh, this is this is an exciting time. Um, I'm Christopher Gray. I'm the creator of Highcaster, a couple of other things, and I'll be running this game. This is a uh, play test of the beta rules. So there are definitely some broken things. In fact, I fixed some broken things last night. So great way to, you know, start the game. Uh, so, uh, well, but we're going to be playing them as written and then, you know, of course, adjust ongoing. Uh, and I think we're probably on the system about 80% there. But this isn't really to educate you on playtesting. This is to entertain. We're going to have some fun with this as well. So why don't I go ahead and introduce the cast? Who wants to go first? Why don't we start with Lydia? Hi everyone, I'm Lydia, I'm half West Tarmit, and I am very excited about the system and the setting and playing my cinnamon roll, Vicky, today. Um, I'm an owl person. Basically, the beast curse can be any form of, um, of, of animal people, if you will, if you like your werewolves and um, like your our Kokra or your uh, shark people yes i'm using examples of friends that are playing those kind of things then the beast cursed are exactly perfect for you because you can be whatever beast you really want and i'm very much looking forward to vicky being adorable a uh, fun story about the beast cursed i had to include that because there's a um, middle schooler that always plays animal uh, animal characters and if i didn't have an animal character for her i would be in big trouble so that was that was her fault I'm, I'm fully supportive of her telling you what to do. She seems just, like a good good source of advice. <laughs> I just take my instructions. Okay, who's next? Let's do a Rex. Do you want to go next? Yeah, hi. I'm Rex. Um, I am very excited to be playing this. I am playing uh, Stein, a basically a rock person, uh, magical. They're, they're living through magic. They're really, really old. Um, they have excessively long memory that is really difficult to access, but it's there. Uh, I'm not quite sure about their personality quite yet. We'll, uh, figure that out as we play, but, uh, they're, pretty awesome they're a good person don't worry about that but yeah i'm excited to play uh with everybody here we've come up with some great characters and world building so i'm super psyched yeah that's one of the in intents of the game is that you create your own high caster and we definitely have already done that so that's that's really cool uh danny why don't you take the next one hi i'm danny uh i am playing Midnight Star. And Midnight Star is an equin. I'm a unicorn. <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm a unicorn. I get to be a unicorn. So I am excited. Um, yeah, you know, there, there are unicorns, but they can be from any, uh, you know, culture, any of that, you know, they're just, they're just there. And Midnight Star has a family. And he, he has, um, he is a warren so he's a he's a fighter basically kind of a a warrior type a warrior unicorn so <laughs> you went an interesting direction where you know you aren't an orphan with a slaughtered family trying to you know get revenge you actually yeah, have I, a family yeah i like found my family i have adopted colts that i found from a devastated village so i'm not an orphan myself but I, I adopted some cult, twin cults that were orphans. Their names are Bittle and Little because they don't have their adult names yet. Okay, last but not least, Spencer, you want to take a stab at, at what you're doing? Yeah, here? yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Spencer at Spencer DV on Twitter. Uh, I am playing Lanaton. Uh, he is the plain Jane vanilla human of the party, and. 
Uh, he is a magister, which is a systems equivalent of a mage. And I decided to play this uh, path because anytime I see a new system and there's magic, and I'm like, I'll, I'll take any mage. So I am here as our magister and apparently a bureaucrat, which is going to be interesting to have to talk if I have to. <laughs> Yeah, I do the same thing. Whenever there's a game, you know, show me the the wizened magic user. I'm there. Uh, yeah, cool. All right, well, um, that's our cast. We are um, playing in the Lands of the Storm, which is a um, sort of a temperate, broadleaf forest, uh, rainforest, and uh, along the sea. And the storm is home to the Kim. Uh, other cultures call them the the Starborn or the Starborn, and um, they are one of the, if not the oldest culture in known history. Uh, they have kept and preserved their culture through uh, eons and have persevered even after the cataclysm when the gods and the sky fell to the earth. And they are. Um, not only are they respected by other cultures throughout Highcaster, but they are, you know, looked at with sort of a sort of mystique and awe. Um, they're sort of intangible and uh, definitely, uh, you know, another category of civilization. So a very proud group of people. Uh, they have a monarch um, who is um, sort of a, uh, a, 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 a god in of themselves. The monarch uh, is said to uh, retain the memories and experiences of all of the prior souls that were also the monarch. And that monarch is called the uh, Kim Ka, which is the language meaning basically the, um, well, I kind of forget what it means. And I don't have the note here, but it means something really important and significant that might come up later. But the uh, the Kim Ka is, uh, is, 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 I wouldn't say worshipped by the people, but definitely feared and respected. Everything comes down to the Kemka, and what they uh, they say as fact is fact. They handle all of the major, you know, disputes. Uh, they handle all of the money and the resources, um, and they try to just distribute it throughout their uh, their kingdom, for lack of a better word. So uh, that's sort of the the world that we're in right now um there aren't a whole lot of interactions with other cultures um kim is pretty isolated in its forest uh, it is um built around a giant 1000 foot tree i don't know what that means in meters but a lot of meters a lot of feet um, the tree is actually uh, one of the oldest things in existence and it has uh, it is now kind of the host of the palace where the Kimka rules and it's the center of of the entire town so um, the city is called Hut Jadu um, which is where the storm is located and the city it, it, it's it's not a city in that you would uh, call a city in your mind's eye probably when you think of city it's really built into the forest underneath the forest and above the forest so I suppose if you were to take a pop culture reference, I would stick it on Rivendell, but um, it, it would be a lot more um, organic than even that. Um, the the Kim have learned how to live within the forest without taking anything away from it. So it's sort of a maze of bridges and arches and subterranean uh, uh, caverns and tree houses and, and all of this sort of intertwined into one big metropolis. And it's a huge city spans from the center where the storm is. Um, by the way, it's called the storm because uh, apparently every thousand years or so, a giant storm comes out of it and decimates the entire land. The um, now lost empire of Highcaster doesn't have anything like that on record, but the Kim know better and they do. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, side note. But what is interesting about right now is that there is a... Um, uh, the annual light festival is happening, which is called the Hebra. The light festival is um, really a celebration of the stars. The Kim say they uh, they were there when the stars were created and ascended to the sky as the gods of Highcaster. They were there when the gods fell. And so 
this festival is sort of in honor of the stars in memory of them. And it's a lantern festival, so, you know, pretty much everybody comes from all over to light lanterns and lift them off into the sky. Um, but there's also um, a lot of uh, tree lighting. Um, the forest is completely lit up, both with natural means and also uh, magical means. Uh, so it's just this really gorgeous spectacle of all of these natural ambient lights all over the forest. Um, and there's a lot of ceremony involved. There are There's a whole gift-giving uh, uh, process where everybody uh, brings gifts to those who attend the festival. Um, and, and they recite ancient verses. They have songs, singing, drinking. And it's like, you know, this week-long thing. So that festival attracts uh, Stairborn from all over the world. And um, they come from... Land, even if they haven't been in the storm for a while, they'll they'll come and visit the the festival. It also sometimes attracts outsiders. So um, that's where we are. I want to start the uh, the scene in a kind of chapter called the um, the homeland. It's a homeland scene, and what the homeland scene is is a chance for you to uh, essentially. Actually, you know what? Let's not start with that. Let's start with a chronicle scene. Chronicle scene means that you have um, complete narrative control over your character. Um, this is an opportunity to th think of it as a montage. It's an opportunity for you to explain what your character is, who they are, what they're doing. Uh, it also is a time for you to be able to introduce truths into the story. So you can, if you want, uh, introduce NPCs. You can um, introduce things about your character that they have. Uh, you can introduce truths about the society in which we live in. Um, anything that you say is going to be true. So you are welcome to shift the, their narrative any way that you want. The only thing that you can't uh, change or affect is uh, the are the other players' characters um, or any threats that might be in play. And right now there aren't any threats in play. So you really, you know, the world is your oyster. But think of this as a montage in Ocean's Eleven where you get to meet your character in all of their glory and splendor. I would also like you to remember that these are characters of, le of legend, even in their own time. Um, they are separate and above society in many ways. And so you have whatever power you need to, uh, to do your job. Um, so keep that in mind when you're, when you're introducing yourselves. Uh, so I guess I'll just turn it over to you all. Who wants to jump in first? The doctors. <laughs> uh, I can well, jump in first. Go for it. Okay. Um, yeah. So, Midnight Star is is preparing for the festival. Um, he's helping uh, his cults prepare, and his mate prepare. They they are making lanterns, um, unicorns who's have telekinetic ability so you know the little cults are learning how to how to learn how to you know manipulate stuff so they're they're hand making their little lanterns that they're eventually going to uh put up into the sky and stuff and uh so so that's what he's helping with or you know he's trying to help bright sun his mate uh help help the children but um, he has to go very soon because he is, um, as a Warren, he sort of has a duty to kind of with so many people coming in and it being such a big deal and everything for the festival and stuff. He's helping with, you know, direct people, you know, make sure people are going the right places, you know, that sort of thing. You know, make sure nobody's going to come in and cause trouble and, you know. Can you give us a visual of what that looks like? If uh, so, he is like standing above the crowds, or is he? Yeah, well, he's a he's a unicorn, and Midnight Star is a he's a medium medium, I think, or no, he's large. Uh, he's he's big, so imagine a, an extremely large horse, um, and he has black hide and a white mane and tail. And he has uh, armor, um, you know, kind of a, a armor along his flanks and stuff. And he carries a spear that's made from um, because ancestors are very important here and here 
And um, so as a matter of fact, you don't become an adult until someone dies <laughs> and you, you, you kind of take, take their place and come fully into an adult. Um, but he has a spear that is made from the horns of his ancestors that was passed down to him, like in a, in a kind of sling across his flank too. And he's sort of, um, yeah, he's maybe like kind of on a platform, you know, you know, maybe a little bit of a, of a, of a platform kind of watching the crowds go by where the stalls are and stuff like that, you know, people, you know, bringing in food or bringing in their gifts or, or whatever it is. And he's, keeping an eye on that you know after having made sure that bright sun and his colts are you know all set and they're making their lanterns and they will be here eventually for the ceremony and stuff what is uh what's stein doing we see his entry uh so there... stein uh stein would be coming in with uh i would say probably like two maybe like a deer and a large like mountain goat or something over each shoulder uh as part of like you know the feast um being one of the hunters uh and one of the uh you know forest warriors for the uh Sturborn. and uh they would be walking through the crowd, probably trying to get wherever they need to go. And uh, as they're doing that, they're kind of just taking in the festival, taking in the um, festivities, you know, saying hi to everybody that they know. And doing this all very casually as they're just carrying, you know, two gigantic carcasses <laughs> of, you know, a, a fresh kill um probably has like they have their uh straps their leather straps and their bag on for all their equipment and everything that they carry with them um i picture them having like flowers like wildflowers and other things tied up through the straps uh to look festive but considering that they're carrying two carcasses, it's this probably really weird like dichotomy of like they're looking festive, they're looking be you know their best, they're you know all their crystals and stones and their skin are polished, um, but they probably have like some blood on them and other stuff from like hunting. And he would walk by and look up at midnight and hello midnight. Do you know where I'm supposed to put these? I was told one place, but I think they moved the cooking bits. Yeah. Midnight will nod and he say, oh, I see you've had great success in the woods today. Well, it's very easy for me to hunt. Yes. I don't think I've ever had an unsuccessful kill. Yes, I, I think you're supposed to, and he nods with his his horn. I think you're supposed to bring all the uh, food over there. Okay. Look, yeah, okay, I see. Yeah, thank you. Uh, how's your, your mate and your colts? Oh, they're very well. They're making their lanterns for this evening. Um, they should be here shortly. They're very excited. It's the colts first festival so hmm. they're a little excited it was a little hard to get them to sleep last night hmm. interesting well i will say hi to them if i see them but i'm gonna go take these and he just they just walk off <laughs> <laughs> and you tell us Can you tell us a bit about the, uh, uh, the, the cooking area that I imagine there's a, um, a pit where they're, they, who being whoever's doing this, the workers, laborers are, uh, are firing it up somehow. And what does the celebration area look like? Uh, so they have, uh, like the open ground pits, um, probably out in the open, uh, the kind that, 
you know, they dig out, they put like the leaves uh, or the, you know, wood and things like that, that they're cooking with um, underneath it. And then they have large uh, like spits, you know, they'll clean and do whatever they need with the animals um, or, you know, fruits and vegetables and things like that as well uh, off to the side. And then, you know, there's the giant spits where they have like, you know, big cages full of, you know, fruits and vegetables and things like that that are getting cooked for people who don't eat meat or, you know, extra things. And then the spits are, you know, to the other side where they have, you know, like the deer or the goats or other, um, you know, other food, you know, slowly turning over the fire being smoked. And it's just like, it's very celebratory. It's very um, communal. So like people are bringing, you know, their own spices or their own, um, their own, you know, flares to it. So everybody's kind of sharing in the cooking and sharing in the culture. And, you know, there's a lot of talking and joking around. It's a very communal place to gather. And so Stein would come in and, find um find you know the open spits and you know bring them to whoever's waiting for them to you know bring them and you know start cleaning them and everything like that okay so uh vicky am i saying that right you've all probably seen vicky fly around all day long um, helping with the lights up in the trees in particular, the ones that not everyone can reach and her whole family is involved. She has a myriad of, she's myriad of sisters and brothers. It, nobody quite know just how many key there are. But uh, when you ev- whenever you see um, avian beast cursed, it's usually part of that family. Many of them work as scoplars, as chroniclers, entertainers, storytellers, uh, performers at the court, and they're fairly well respected. Uh, Biki is definitely one of the most present ones of the family, just because she will not pass up any opportunity to chat with someone, to talk to someone, to figure out what they've been up to. And she's flittering about on her owl wings. Um, her eyes are pretty much 90% of her face, huge button eyes. Um, she's, a, if you picture a great horned owl, she's, she has a couple of stubs of the little feathers, but she's still quite young, so they're not quite as majestic as she would like them to be. One day, one day. Um, and she's usually the first one to offer to fly up the lights into the highest parts of the tree because, hey, flying. And she will do completely unnecessary pirouettes and stunts on the way. So it's um, it's it's definitely visible. You know where she is at all times, either because of the pirouettes or because of the wee that you hear every now and then. I think she might actually, having seen you, Stein, coming in, uh, drop down in a in a fairly adventurous straight drop, and then just spread her wings just before he hits the ground you're tall right you're a very large creature person yes uh stein is uh very tall uh they're fairly slender they're not like particularly you know large in the sense of like you know big arms or anything um but they're very tall they're fairly slender uh, they have dark gray stone skin, almost like um, like volcanic rock, mm-hmm. uh, but it's very smooth. And then throughout that, there would be like crystals or, um, you know, bits of precious metals kind of woven or dotted throughout their skin. So um, Vicky is tiny for compared to most of you, most likely. Um what would Stein's opinion be if Vicky every now and then landed on their shoulder or their head and used them as a perch? They would be startled by it if they weren't expecting it, but otherwise I don't think they would mind. I think at this point they probably just accept that it happens. <laughs> and then there's no point as... in, you know. <laughs> then as soon as you drop 
the carcass, you feel the claws kind of on your shoulder and um, both side and Piki leans over your head. So she's upside down and goes, hi. Hello. You know, you're going to blunt your nails on my shoulders. That's fine. I need to cut them anyway. And it's just like that, like that yeah. teeth wiggling <laughs> noise of like claws on like porous stone. Are you here to eat or help cook or what are you doing? Uh, eat. Always eat. I'm having a break and then I have to put, don't tell them, I have to put the glitter balloons up. I have glitter balloons. I made glitter balloons. Ooh. I can't wait to see those. Those will be very pretty. Did and you get the did you get the crystal dust that I sent you? Yeah. The purple okay. and the blue are really good. And if you pop the balloon over someone you don't like, then it will take a while for them to get the glitter out of their hair, which I may have tested on my brother. Well, they have your brother has feathers, but Yes, I see the point would still stand. Yeah. It's very clever. Yeah. I could see Midnight being very annoyed by that, but his colts mm-hmm. would love it. Tempting. I may have given his colts a bag of that stuff. Yes. You're the best worst influence. I try. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of experience and shenanigans. <sighs> You never tell me the fun stories. One of these days, I want the fun stories, like the ones where where you got in trouble. You never tell me when you get in trouble. Yes, well, I don't have a record here. As far as I know, you have a record. Where? Who? What? And she picks up her notebook (laughs) that she always has on her in a pouch that is easily easy to reach. Well. I don't remember off the top of my head, as you say. Um, it would take a while for me to remember it, but I'm sure it's another city somewhere. Which culture? Which people? What did you do? Did you kill someone? It might have been the High Folk. Ooh. If I remember right, they are very strict about their their guardsmen are very strict, but I could be wrong. It's it's hard to remember. She writes down High Folk question mark maybe murder definitely on the list somewhere. Speaking of trouble, where is Lena Chen? Hmm. I'm not too sure. He might be organizing. He likes to organize, as far as I know. At least that's his job. I don't know if he likes it. I don't. <laughs> where is Lena Chen? Uh, I like to imagine he's at least close enough to hear this conversation. Um, he's wearing sort of these mostly earthen color robes various browns, reds, oranges. Um, He has this sort of large looking wooden contraption on his back that is the sort of magical Richter scale we talked about earlier. It sort of acts like the uh, old fashioned uh, machines they used to make thunder in old theaters. So I'm sure because of where we're at, you probably hear a very low rumbling of thunder. It's like, Wish I didn't have to worry about organizing, but uh, I have some time for a break. Vicky, sort of looking up on Stein's shoulder. She waves a wing. You trying to get stories out of him again, too? He killed someone, I think. He sort of looks over to Stein and gives a look of like, did you? <laughs> I mean, I've killed plenty of people. I think she might be referring to murder, though. That's different. What? I mean, I've killed plenty of people, too. I mean, in defense of this place. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever killed anyone, Vicky? And you see her getting a little bit flustered by her feathers and face standing up and getting a bit poofy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many, <laughs> M- many, like at least five. Is, that's many. At least five. I stopped counting after five. Killed, killed them. Dead. So Stein mm. chuckles at that, and Stein doesn't have 
literally any biological functions whatsoever. Um, their voice comes magically from their mouth. Their mouth is just, you know, like stone formed, like a, you know, normal humanoid person's face, you know, eyes, nose, mouth, an approximation of teeth, but there's like not really anything there. It just kind of glows a little bit when they talk. And so when they chuckle, they don't actually have like the muscle movement of laughing and Stein approximates the movement. So Stein's shoulders like bob a little awkwardly and it makes Vicky also bob <laughs> as they chuckle and laugh. Uh. And it's kind of awkward because like the rest of them doesn't really move. Like there's not the belly laugh. There's not, yeah. the, you know, contractions in the torso. It's just like a little bit of like shoulder bobbing and a little bit of torso movement and it. Y'all would be used to it, but it is awkward looking. Uh, still haven't gotten used to that. Um, while I'm here, I said break, but a rock hem's work is never done. Um, anything you folks need help with? Did you want any particular spices on? I, I have the goat. You like goat, I think. Yeah, goat works. I'm not picky. I don't know the difference. I just know some people prefer venison. Some people prefer the lamb. Mm. <laughs> Vicky's flying off to chat up the people that have started cooking and uh, scavenge a couple of things because they always offer food or to little... Uh, you know, if you if you chat to enough people one by one, and they offer you a taste, you can get a full meal out of that. <laughs> you don't have to lift a finger. So, so no uh, scurrying around and finding rats for you. Yeah. Oh, well, there's um, we're gonna change over to a uh, a homeland scene. Homeland means that we're, there aren't any, uh, we might do some dice rolling, but the threats aren't really dire. I mean, they're just situations happening in, in the home front. And this kind of allows us to explore the, uh, explore the world a bit. Um, so there is a, um, a trumpet announcement. Uh, who of you knew that there was an emissary coming from the Rishan to attend the festival? Uh, I assume Lonaton would because they're a bureaucrat here, so they're that might be part of their job is to work on welcoming in emissaries. And I think probably forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I think Midnight would know. As a Warren, he would probably know that some VIP was coming. I'd say maybe Stein heard something about it, but forgot as well. But they've been out hunting and out in the wilds most of the time, so it probably didn't clock on their radar, so to speak. Well, uh, Jewel Theolis uh, from Rishfin and her retinue have arrived. Uh, this is kind of an important occasion because uh, certainly you wouldn't see an emissary any other time of the year. But um, the fact that the Rishan are coming into the storm is highly unusual. Um, there have been emissaries from other cultures from far beyond, including the Hydoni, who do have settlements sort of outside of the marches around the storm. But uh, the Rishan kind of keep to their trade routes. Uh, and there have been uh, lots of camaraderie between the two cultures, but they're usually out in the field uh, to, to negotiate trade. The Kimra will send, or sorry, the Kimka will send an expedition to meet the Rishan in order to conduct trade or whatever, you know, negotiations they need to conduct. But the fact that somebody's coming in from Rishan to the storm is, is highly unusual. Um, it, it's almost, it may have been something that has never actually happened. So um, the trumpets are announcing their arrival. Those are from, you know, the, uh, uh, the scouts outside of the city. 
Uh, so you know that the retinue is coming. Uh, you know that the Rishin tend to travel uh, in pretty big caravans. So this is likely going to take quite a while to get them into the city through the forest and settled. So what's the plan? Uh, I'd imagine Midnight's job is, uh, you know, kind of making way, perhaps, you know, making sure that the, the entourage has, you know, room to bring their, their retinue through and all that stuff when they reach the city and everything. So he probably goes and takes up a position somewhere, you know, near the gate, perhaps, or something, you know, you know, shooing people away, perhaps, you know, trying to make room and everything so that they can bring their carts or carriages or whatever they happen to have through. Uh, I believe uh, Lanathon's job would probably be welcoming the entirety of the representation of the Rishan into our home and starting their way. Um, I guess this is a question I should bring up because of where Lanatan's from. Uh, do I recognize any of the people in the entourage? Uh, since we are in a homeland scene, uh, that means that that is up to me. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm going to default with probably not. However, um, this is an opportunity to use a favor uh, favor is currency. If we were at a physical table, we'd be using tokens. Uh, but right now, everybody starts off since we're uh, since we showed up today with one favor. You can spend favor to introduce truths. Uh, so uh, this is an opportunity to say yes, I do know them. Um, if you want to spend for that, the other thing that you use favor for is to add uh, an advantage die to a roll, and mm -hmm. you might use favor also to confront a threat that's already been subdued. And there are situations, especially in um, tense situations with lots of complexities where you might want to do that. But right now, uh, there aren't any threats. Uh, so you can, if you'd like to, use favor to introduce the truth, or we'll just go with that you don't know. Oh, we'll, we'll just go with that I don't know any of them. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, retinue is, um, is about 100 or so strong. They, they have multiple wagons and with all of their supplies probably took them a good couple of weeks to get here if they had come from the outskirts of Rishon. Um, so so they're they're pretty well supplied, which means there's a lot of them and there's a lot of things and they have like a whole pack of animals behind them. And, um, and you can see that the emissary is in a um, very ornate wagon. Um, in, in the Rishan style, which is lots of scarves, lots of very well-decorated uh, well, uh, wooden statues and carvings, and, you know, it's sort of set up as a, a, a little mobile palace, but kind of like stumbling its way through the forest <laughs> as it's trying to, you know, and occasionally they'll have to like move it around a big boulder or, you know, kind of heft it over a creek. And, I mean, this is uh, essentially the Pacific Northwest, so we're dealing with tons of ferns, Lots of rocks, lots of moss, random creeks everywhere, and huge trees. So um, it's not exactly easy to get through, but they're making way. Do we see them coming? Like, do we see them coming into the field? Yeah, they, well, the, they're out the outskirts still. The scouts have announced it with horns. So, you know, you can come to whatever high point you need to see them. Or you can go out to them. Yeah, I think Stein would probably, after finishing their you know errand on the hunt uh they would go over to you know help keep an eye on things as well um you know being kind of one of the scouts or hunters of the stirborn uh you know he he helps they help keep things safe as well um but if they see the cart struggling over a particular stone um or you know, a pothole is, you know, a large divot in the ground or something just would be sitting there and watching, but anybody looking closely would see like boulders start to shrink down into the ground or fill in potholes and, you know, smooth things out. And Stein is just kind of st standing there like a very still statue, just watching, but you see the ground like level out just a little bit here and there 
with the rocks and the dirt and everything. Well, making it easier for them to get through. Mm -hmm. So, um, Solanatan, are you going up to greet them or are you going to wait for them to arrive into the city? Which is, it's not walled like you would normally think a city to be walled, but it is definitely blockaded through nature. <laughs> so mm -hmm. there's really only one way through, and that is the path, but it's not a well-trodden path. So, um, but so I mean, you could definitely wait there or on the uh, the balconies and the tree houses and things built over, or or you could come out and join them. Uh, I think he, yeah, he'd probably go out and join them. Yeah, and Midnight yeah. Star, you know, they, the the um, uh, the initial entourage are armed Russian guards. Uh, so they have kind of marched in formation as best they could and have already arrived sort of at the threshold and are just waiting there for the rest of the retinue to arrive. Yeah, Midnight will, you know, kind of take up, you know, kind of position, you know, nearby around, you know, around them, you know, sort of, you know, you know, nod at them in greeting, you know, bow his head a little bit and, and you know, get in position like like what sorts of things are these like what sorts of weapons do they have what sort of like armor and stuff are they wearing yeah they are they're pretty well equipped they have spears um and they you they have capes and you know sort of um the pauldrons and and tunics but they don't you know they're not like knights in mm -hmm. fact i don't think anybody here would have seen knights in the way that we think of them but uh but they're well armored um they also have uh a short sort of um uh, uh, rounded blades. There's a name for it. This leading like leaf leaf shaped blades uh, mm -hmm. uh, that are used for close combat. But they're they're spearsmen. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Midnight will you know kind of take position you know nearby or like just behind or you know whatever's going to be kind of a show of you know our 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 forces and their forces sort of you know kind of waiting and stuff like that. You know, yeah, he'd, the, he'd, he'd actually probably like try to get the any of the other warrens and stuff too to kind of, you know, make kind of a united sort of showing to, you know, in front of them as well. So, okay, so the warren are sort of stepping out, not posturing, but presenting, yeah, presenting like, yeah. you know, it, it's a formal kind of, you know, we're greeting and stuff like that. They come in and kind of form up, and then we probably would too. A little bit just presenting themselves you know yeah for sure there's a um a sort of long-haired uh uh viver human that steps out of the ornate carriage and um wearing flowing robes um kind of beautifully decorated lots of uh jewelry around his shoulders and uh, he sees, uh, let's see if I get the names right, Lanatan approaching uh, and gives you sort of the universal, you know, hands up because I'm not carrying a weapon greeting. Yep. He recognizes you as sort of the, it. yeah, sort of the uh, person that needs to, that, you, that he needs to talk with. Greetings. Uh, uh, hello, I am representing uh, the emissary of Rishvin. May we have uh, a, a acceptance to come into your realm? It looks like he's um, drunk. He's talking a little funny. <laughs> oh, in in his head, Lonaton's just sitting there thinking like, oh, pompous prick. Um, you may have permission, of course. Permission, that's the word I was looking for. Uh, Jewel, uh, Jewel Theolis, the, the, the <clears throat> Jewel Theolis is a well-respected member of the guilds of Rishfin, and she wants to pay her uh, dues, observances, she wants to show respect for the Festivals of Lights. Well, we're, I believe we just got finished setting up, so I'm sure she'll be delighted. 
I am Daramond. I am the emissary's chief counsel. And I am Reika Lanitan. I serve as a bureaucrat for the, I believe you call them the Sterberin people. Say again. I am Reika Lanitan. I serve as a bureaucrat for what I believe you call the Sterberin people. Lanikan. Lanitan. There you go. Nice to meet you. And then he uh, gestures, and so the um, they start guiding the the wagon forward. And I guess like, did this guy come out of the wagon, or is he like, sort of just leaning out of the window and talking? Yeah, he came out of the wagon. Uh, Lonaton will sort of just walk alongside the what I assume is the lead wagon of this sort of caravan, and just have what is idle but for him extremely taxing conversation uh because while he himself used to be of the uh russian people he's in his time here with the chem is he's not a fan he's not a fan of the culture and the dealings they have so he'll talk he's not gonna enjoy it but he'll talk yeah, it's clear this guy was imbibing, uh, you know, on the way, <laughs> and he's kind of <laughs> holding it together long enough to get the introductions done. Um, and they don't seem to be uh, any menace or disrespect. They're just sort of going through. Now, you haven't seen the emissary. She's still inside. Um, but the uh, the wagon arrives at the at the the path into into the city. Uh, the city is named Hoot Jadu. Yeah. And I have our our warrens or, you know, we would kind of like when they start actually in the city, you know, we would kind of probably like escort, you know, along with their people, you know, beside them probably, you know, just kind of fall in line beside the the caravan to like, you know, escort them where 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 they're going to be, you know. Yeah. And yeah. Like and it's sort of um, once you get inside of who Jadu, it's much easier going, obviously. So the uh, Warren can kind of uh, circle around as the the soldiers walk forward and then the wagons and they kind of get the livestock in. And that's when a lot of the other laborers come in to start helping. And they're guided towards an area underneath the storm, which is the, the in any other city, it would be the plaza or the courtyard. But here it's sort of where um, more like festival grounds. And uh, it's sort of a clear open area amidst the trees. And that's kind of where they're gathering. There's plenty of space for them. They're nearby the fire pit. So at this point, the others who, uh, who have not been outside or on uh, the balconies or the tree houses can see the, uh, the retinue has arrived. The Kim Ka's guard are also coming out. They're emerging from the storm and they're sort of taking position high on balconies over the courtyard. He's most likely stuffing her face and completely oblivious to what's happening until it's very hard to ignore it. Um, so she quickly flies over, still chewing, still uh, trying to get it off her feathers. And I'm like, what's happening? What's happening? Who is that? You're whispering to. Um... I think to Midnight Star. Um, well, you think you're whispering to Midnight Star, but you're actually whispering to a, 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 a Neblar, who is a ah. fairy. Uh, she is uh, dressed in robes, uh, has a tiara, um, large monarch wings, bright green hair that's cut short, pixie short, if you will. And, uh, and she's saying, I don't know to you, but you, you don't have no idea who this is. And you know who everybody is. Who are you? Jewel, who are you? She's uh, <laughs> sitting on top of Midnight Star. And Midnight Star, uh, she is so light, you don't know anybody's there until you hear the whispering. I'm Vicky. Hi, are you a friend of Midnight's? Who's Midnight? <laughs> Your chair. <laughs> Why are we whispering? <laughs> I'm not 
Yeah, sure. I just <laughs> heard noise, and it seems like you whisper when there's noise and you don't know what's going on. I don't know who came up with that rule. Oh. Are you from around here? I haven't seen you. Uh, no, I no, people. I'm from... I don't know. I'm from Richmond. <clears throat> What's for dinner? <laughs> uh, here. And she pick, takes from her from br breast pocket. Um, she they're, picks they're up food. They're now eating on my back. There. Yeah, yeah, we're eating. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a very crumbled piece of uh, piece of cake. That, well, that um, yeah. That goes down very quickly. Yeah, Jules, like uh, that was good. It reminds me of a vanilla cake we have uh, back I like, home. I like vanilla cake. We don't really do sweets very well here. I think we do fruits. We 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 do alcohol really well, and we have good hunters, but sugar is mm, just not something many people like here. I don't understand why. Don't tell Derriman. He's had enough to drink already. And she glares at this uh, uh, this human in robes who's been like, who's now like throwing back some pitcher or something. <laughs> and since I, I, was... I must be hearing this whole oh, yes, yeah, definitely because they're on my back. Yeah. So, since I can, I'm assuming I've been sticking around this guy most of the time they've been here. Yeah. Can I, can I see this uh, pixie individual sort of glare over? at i guess at us since i'm probably like with him and it suddenly dawns on you like oh she's not inside I, the cart <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i'm like i just look over and i'm like <laughs> it's a look that just says help <laughs> oh, that's not and he's hating his life right now it's very funny when he does that <laughs> oh uh, midnight midnight kind of turns his head you know just to kind of you know take a look back and he says it's a pleasure to meet you emissary well thank you but don't call me that call me jewel <laughs> uh very well <laughs> so where's the king or the I look around <laughs> Can't, what, what do you call him the time walks guy. up right at that point <laughs> just <laughs> hi hi <laughs> Stan. That's Jewel. She's important. No. <laughs> Hi, Jules. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm supposed to bring. Um, we have some gifts uh, that we're supposed to bring to the the Kim Ka. Sugar, sugar, sugar. I'm looking around to see if he's if if the monarch is like you know where the palace doors are or where the the monarch's going to be coming out. Perhaps yeah. they have the. Um, you know the guards are out and they're wearing the they actually wear gold armor it's not supposed to be armor like it's not really armor but it's decorative um you know breastplate and they have hats with the uh, um i don't know, see i'm trying to think what kind of let's say they're hawk feathers mm -hmm. um and and they're all you know postured out there with their spears looking important but you don't see the chemka this is not unusual. He doesn't show his face unless he has to, because yeah. you know he's really old. Probably waiting for a big entrance. They do that. <laughs> uh, Midnight says, "Well, I do not see our monarch at the moment, but I'm. We're more than happy to escort you to the storm." And he nods at the tree with the guards. Or we can race. She flutters her wings. Midnight narrows his eyes. <laughs> well, I don't want to intrude. Races are exciting. That was to uh, uh, Vicky suggested the race to Jewel because I think she can fly as well with the mm -hmm. wings. Yeah. Mm. Well, uh, the party is starting. And um, Jewel takes uh, no hesitation in joining the party. I mean, she's, and I guess uh, Lonaton would know this about the Richfin. They're not very formal. Um, 
you know, this is as formal as they get. They're merchants. You know, they they are traders. They go from culture to culture, and their whole job is, you know, uh, sales. <laughs> so they don't, you know, they'll, they'll blend in pretty okay. And if there's a party, they're all about it. Um, so the the Rishan are um, are definitely joining the celebration. Uh, it's becoming close to it's it's getting close to night, which means that the lanterns will be released soon. Hmm. And um, that means that the Kim Ka needs to come out and make, you know, start reciting the verses of the ancient texts about the stars. <sighs> Is and my family can... here yet? My family yes. arrived. Yes. Yes. Yeah, they would be here by now. The Colts would be extremely excited, <laughs> running around and being mischievous. I'm sure. Are they or midnight? Or uh, are they or? Uh... Uh, bright sun uh, covered in glitter. Not no, yet, but, like... but you just wait. Yeah, but what I imagine is is there being like the cults are being very like giggly and cagey about something. So mm -hmm. midnight suspects something is up. Like you know, you two behave yourselves, and they just like giggle and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> like, little cult. Stein is stone faced and innocent looking. <laughs> <laughs> Vicky points out the strategic places of the glitter balloons that can be popped with a dart or something. Some giggling, but you don't know why. Uh, and, and suddenly trumpets. Uh, so the Kim Ka is coming out. And um, these are not like, you know, old English trumpets. These are sort of like, they're, I don't know, they're, they're horns. They're more like uh, from... I don't know how you make horns like that from antlers, I'm guessing. Uh, so the horns go, and uh, the Kim Ka is going to come out. So there's a really hushed silence. Uh, the retinue, Jewel, everybody's really quiet. And, it, and you know, it's always this really tense moment as everybody knows the most important person there is about to come out and do something really important for the most important festival, uh, honoring some of the most important traditions in, 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 in this long culture's history. And as this hush that comes over everybody and emerging from the uh the balcony of the storm is the kim ka um dressed in golden robes um now he he's more plant than man <laughs> these days and the older he gets the more plant like he becomes and so he looks very uh amorphous um green and leathery but has sort of humanish features um, and sort of glides out and there are vines all over him and um, they kind of are cascading down to the floor as part of his robe completely hairless you know he's more uh, more like a moving uh, vine really and pauses as a really long drawn out dramatic pause and in that moment you hear <coughs> and glitter falls as a waterfall column all over Midnight Star. And the two cults are looking at each other side eye to side eye and the entire city turns to look. <laughs> I I would like to say while we were positioning for this for the Chemcot to come out, uh Lanatan will position his new friend, quote unquote, uh I would Bicky have told Lonaton where these glitter balloons are? Oh no. <laughs> I'd like to imagine. No, no, no. Um, she would have tried to maneuver you underneath one several times. <laughs> All right, never mind then. <laughs> but if you want, um if you if you want to get your uh friend, your new friend there um i'm fully willing to spend a favor trying to get you under a glitter bomb and trying to pop that but instead it hits the other dude yeah I, i'm i'm chill with that i don't care it's a good use of currency <laughs> currency for pranks you know so is this a separate balloon that goes off separately and douses derriman or was derriman underneath the balloon as well uh, um, you go. I like to imagine 
uh Ma- because of this lonaton's under it but somehow has an inkling because they know bicky at this point so he has this spell that sort of just creates this little like domed air pocket above <laughs> his head so it just slides off of that and onto Darabon. <laughs> yeah what it might be is is that one like let off another one or something <laughs> when it somehow went off. there was a yeah, loud it, it noise. happens like after everybody's looking and there's a long <laughs> pause and then it goes boof again <laughs> <laughs> and then the f- deep voice of the Kimka, whose name is Kimiten, Kimiten, which is the storm is satisfied. They take on a new name whenever they're in office. He's been in office for who knows how long, 100 years. But his deep voice resonates and fills up the entire forest. As he says, it seems I missed the beginning of the party. And nobody knows if he's joking or not. So then he goes, And so the tension relieves. And then he does his, uh, you know, hour and a half recitation of the history of the gods, which maybe was captivating the first time you heard it by your, you know, early school teachers who were all animated, you know? But not when the Kim Ka does it. He's very reverent, very sullen, and that sort of deep drawl uh, voice. And it just goes on and on and on. I mean, it's a story you could summarize in a couple of sentences. He, he really could do this in like 20 minutes. <laughs> Meanwhile, Midnight is, is glaring at his Colts. <laughs> Multicolor sparkling midnight. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it it's um, it, it's multi it's the it's the blue, the green, the orange, and a little bit of pink in there as well. Of just like crystal powder or like stone powder, or whatever would work. Would midnight suspect Stein gave it to them? Or somebody gave it to him? I mean, probably, yeah. <laughs> so then I would glance over at Stein. Well, during so during this whole recitation, Stein has, like, completely gone still. And Stein is not paying any attention whatsoever to this recitation they know how long it takes they've heard it a million times technically they've only needed to learn it here at once to know it um so stein just spends this hour and a half amount of time just like in a memory and is just standing there with like their eyes closed so when their eyes are closed they have they have one like pink crystal eye that has a little bit of like glint to it and then one eye that is like made of um like solid silver with some texture on it um and the, you know they move around and things like that when they're looking or they're making facial expressions but in this sense they're standing there and their eyes aren't closed because they want to look like they're looking at where they're supposed to but they're, it's very obvious that they're not paying attention because their eyes have like glazed over, like their eyes have dimmed. And they're just standing there. And they're going back into another memory during this. And it would probably take them a couple minutes to come out of it once the uh, recitation is done. Mm. Or unless there's like some other big stimulating thing that happens outside. Mm. But otherwise, they're just standing there creepy as hell <laughs> midnight would probably see see that and be like well they're no help right now i'll have to talk to them later <laughs> is I... jewel still here or have they moved on to the wards the camera she's uh, uh she is bored out of her skull and is kind of like drifting off a bit on she's like this kind of on midnight's back and it's kind of like 
Is she covered in glitter too? Yes. <laughs> she would have to be. And so is Daramond. I mean, she thought it was funny. Daramond did not. And he's been like <laughs> trying to clean himself, but it's futile. And... He, a lot of times, just ignoring Daramond. And once during the recitation, we'll sort of look over at Bicky and just gives a very slow and tries to be subtle about it thumbs up <laughs> and then just lowers it down. <laughs> Vicky blinks twice with her big eyes and uh, fails to look innocent. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> So after the recitation, the party begins, things liven up. Um, but at that point, um, the Kimka has invited Jewel into the storm. Um, they are in there for a better part of the night. But there's a point in which uh, the, the Kimka's personal guard come down. And they come down and seek all of you to collect you and bring you into the storm as well. Uh, so that can just happen, or you can tell me what you are doing when the uh, Kim Cause guard finds you several hours into the party. <laughs> um, at this point, he's usually a very hard-pressed person to do this, but after dealing with Daramund for s probably several hours at this point, Lanatan has started drinking. <laughs> <laughs> they are drinking probably the hardest chem liquor available at this moment, just sort of sipping it while Dermot probably continuously complains about the glitter. He acts concerned, but really isn't. It's just sort of sipping at what I assume for here probably, I don't know, probably some type of uh, vodka maybe. And it's yeah, just sort of, I was just thinking that through there might be because of the, the, you know, the, <clears throat> the forest it might be a, a honey liquor oh yeah it's just sort of sipping at it <sighs> stein has probably joined you to after after pranking midnight star stein has probably tried to act innocent i don't know if midnight has talked to them yet about the prank or the glitter supply or any of that um but I'm sure Stein has probably talked to uh, Bright Sun and the Colts a little bit and, you know, gone around and chatted with everybody. But at this point, probably feeling sorry for Lanaton, like, sits down with him and is chatting with him. And the first time that uh, Derman gets up to, like, go grab something or, uh, like, comes back from getting, like, food or drink... There's like a subtle shift in the ground as he steps um, to where like the ground, you know, just goes up just a little bit in front of his toes or maybe just down a little bit uh, to try and uh, trip Dermund as he's carrying this plate of food or whatever oh, he has. No. <laughs> yeah, we are important people. Let's <laughs> screw with the dignitaries as soon as they come in town. <laughs> Well, what are you going to do? Blame the ground? The ground came up. It's like, no, and you're he's drunk. been drinking, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. For, for him, you know, falling face first into the, um, the you know, patch of ferns was hilarious, you know, uh, and he has dropped all of the food and, you know, he, he's just rolling because, and he can't stop laughing. I mean, he's doing that kind of, that moment of drunkenness where laughter just, just will not stop. And, you know, he's kind of heaving. He, he's completely lost all touch with reality at this point. <laughs> this is, yeah, because this is something that would happen to me. Um, <laughs> he is taking, like, a sip of the vodka when that happens. And it, it managed to get enough of a star out of him that it, he, like, shoots a little bit of the vodka, like, out of his nose. Oh, no. And he's just like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when the Kim Ka's personal guard <laughs> who everybody that's lovingly the calls the wall the <laughs> like it's one of these walks up to you and you have to like look up hello the eternal one wants to see you now <sighs> S 
slug down the rest of it. Set it down. <sighs> they coming too. Points his thumb over at Stein. Stein has a big shit-eating grin. Yes, the Eternal One has requested all of the four. Hmm. You are colloquially called the four uh, because you're sort of the trusted advisors. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the ones that are always called into the storm when things go wrong. All right. <laughs> yeah. The wall, who's a, who's a fiend, by the way. So he's got these giant demon horns. You know, he's got this blood red skin. Is not at all amused. You know, I think you should still get uh, some gems or something for those horns. Like some extra decorate. I could find some when I go to the mountains next time. It was not my part. It was not my instruction to converse in you in any way. Couldn't converse with you in any way. Well, it seems like you're doing that. Having trouble talking today. <laughs> and as uh, if we leave, I get. I assume the wall follows us, or yes. Let's okay. Yeah. And he's like, as they're sort of walking over to the storm, he'll look over at signs like, "Uh, I'm sure what uh what pronouns did you say that the wall used?" He, him. Okay, gotcha. It's like, sort of, not so subtly, you know, points his head towards the wall. It's just like, he really could use more decoration. Something like this, and sort of points to the sort of like circlet made of vines that wraps around his head. And there is a sort of like small black gem set into the center of this that has multiple colors and it. it's almost kind of like it's a small galaxy in the gem probably make him easier to talk to is it subtle enough he... that he doesn't notice uh y Ooh. I'll say yes I think we've pissed him off enough already tonight <laughs> Vicky flying around will only say don't let them talk you into anything you are beautiful just the way you are because <laughs> she's had some of the mead the honey <laughs> wine can i give you a hug that's a no if he could talk which he's not going to he would say flying rat but he caught his tongue i love and you did not say it he was thinking it he didn't say it how much have you been drinking tonight, Bicky? I only had this one cup. And I refilled it twice. <laughs> <laughs> well, that might explain that. Is is Lanaton wearing robes? Or uh, like what's sort, his sort of. So they like, have Does he have this... a cloak or it's sort of like what a uh, uh sleeveless sort of like uh, deep brown uh, robe that sort of goes down to about his legs and has all these sort of like orange and red and green accents on it. And he wears like sort of like this vest underneath it or more of like a tunic kind of thing. Okay. So at some point as we walk towards like away from the party towards the um towards the castle like away from like the cooking pits and the feasting area at some point you would feel like a tug on your cloak and you look down and there is this um mountain goat with like a leather collar on nibbling on the end of your robe just like as it trots along I, behind I, you I, I, and stein turns around and looks down and picks up the goat Oh, sorry. I thought he went to eat already. So you're affecting narrative in a homeland scene. You'll need to pay favor. Well, so out of curiosity, okay, so there is for Wildkin a beast folk that oh, okay. is your acquaintance. Yeah, that doesn't so count. This, then. You don't have to spend for that. 
So this would be Stein's. It, the goat has been hiding from in the party for a while because, you know, we're busy cooking goats and other animals. So it's kind of just been like off, probably also walking around like eating food and like bothering people just in the crowd. And everyone's probably used to seeing it and knows whose it is, but it's just goes by goat. Like Stein didn't give it a name. It just... <laughs> follows well, did, him around for some yeah, reason they did give him a name goat <laughs> so it's just a, this like kind of fuzzy uh white and gray mountain goat that just came out of the bushes <sighs> worked on this and he sort of picks up the end of this rope it's sure like one of those things where it's like the corners been chewed off it's soggy and like uh, frayed. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, I made that. this by hand instead of magic. <sighs> well, it's plant fibers, you can't blame them. He just sort of glares and gets as much of like the goat slobber, I guess, off of it as he can and just sort of lets it fall again, just keeps walking. Stein puts the goat back down on the ground and like pushes it towards like the tree line. Like you can't come into the castle or into the what is it? What is it called? It's, well, it's the, the storm, storm is the name of the, the tree storm and also the region. Yeah. yeah, you can't come in the storm. And he just like plucks the plunks the goat down on the ground and glares at it and then keeps following the wall. <laughs> so the goat's gonna cause goat trouble. All right, great. Yeah, you don't have to pay favor for that. That's yours. So uh, inside the storm, you've all been in there many times, but this is the main audience hall. And it's a, a area that's been uh, magically carved out of the center of this massive tree. Um, there is a throne built into the, it's actually part of the floor, you know, kind of grown out um, and it has branches and vines and it's living still, not like a dead part of the tree. And, um, and the Kimka is sitting in that throne. Uh, the emissary, Jewel, is uh, sitting uh, on on his knee because it's probably easier to talk to him that way. <laughs> but it's a little irreverent. And you can tell that uh, he's a bit uncomfortable with it. Um, but they both look up as you come in. Uh, the chamber is surrounded by, uh, there are probably six or seven of the uh, palace guards in there. Um, it's beautifully decorated with, uh, with mostly local floral that is just growing out of the walls. Um, there isn't much for furniture, though, and that's by design. It's just meant to look pretty and majestic, but isn't very utilitarian. Uh, so you enter, and then they both look, kind of look up at you uh, without really saying anything. They're sort of like a, they were in the middle of a conversation. Midnight's gonna clomp forward. <laughs> oh, so you said the party had been going on for a little while. Yeah. When they came and got us. Yeah. A couple like hours. How long? Couple hours. Yeah. I'm gonna say my my colts they they ran themselves out, <laughs> like within the first, and they're insisting they're not tired or anything like that, but like they are. <laughs> and so like when he when they came to get midnight, he was like trying to you know. Him and Bright Sun were trying to convince them, you know, like, oh, maybe it's time to go home now. And they're like, no, no, we don't want to go. They had way too many sugary drinks from, way too from many. the berries. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's what he was doing. So, yeah, he kind of clomps forward, you know, bows, you know, but just his head forward. All right. So, um, so you all are in there and the Kim Ka says, thank you for, for coming. It seems that our friends up north are having some very interesting challenges. And yes, they have brought us gifts for the celebration, but Jewel arrived here with another request. I will let her say it. Uh, she kind of turns around and sort of clears her throat. She said, well, <clears throat> I didn't know you were the four. Uh, Hi, Jewel. Uh, hi again. 
I don't know how else to say this, but our um, our trade routes are overrun with spirits, and we're having difficulty getting through. The Hydoni are nearby. They are, as you know, on our borders too. And uh, we have been forced to go through their lands. And so we've had to pay some very heavy taxes on our wares. So we were hoping, because um, we can't go to the Hydoni, we were hoping that the Kim could help us solve this problem and find out why these spirits are are here and what they need so we can get rid of them or tell them to move on. And um, we thought of coming here because you seem to know more about spirits than we do. We're just merchants. I know this Minnie. sounds crazy. And I will glance at Vicky because she knows about those things. Vicky has drifted off and um, being a little bit tipsy <laughs> and looking at some of the uh, beautiful flower decorations in the area. Vicky? Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, I am here. What have you heard of the past minute of conversation? <laughs> All of it. You 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 said hi. What did they ask for help with? Things. I'm sorry. I uh, it was a long day. I had a lot of work. There was a lot of flying around. I may have had some meat. Can you repeat the question, please? Um, their road they've been trying to take is apparently blocked by spirits. Ooh, that's cool. And they've we asked go? us, um, well, they have asked us to take care of it. Yes. Midnight's My dear Lana the only sober person in this room right now. <laughs> <laughs> also, what do, like, if is there a role or a, like, a kind of uh, lore, kind of lore check to see what Vicky would know about that? Yeah, we, there is. Um, however, that'll be in preparation for your journey. So we'll go into that okay. next. Um, he says, my dear Lanatan, I am not, she is not asking for us to go. I am commanding the four on behalf of the Kim as a gesture of camaraderie between two cultures that you do go as the four, as my, mo my most prized individuals. He's looking at Bixie <laughs> to go and solve this problem. Because if we can make these roads work, then our two people can become even stronger alliances. And as the Hydoni continue to expand their space and encroach on our marches, we will have friends when we need them. Yes, the Hydoni tend to not have respect for nature as we do. You will leave in the morning at first light. All right. Gives me plenty of time to prepare. Over up, you mean. <laughs> I'm fine, unlike someone. Are you looking oh, at me? Like That's her? me. Yeah, I'm looking at Betty. <laughs> <laughs> I don't require sleep. It's nice. <laughs> I'm we good. are we are four of the most important people in this <laughs> village. Hey, look, Midnight's being dignified. He's not the one that rolled up in here, fell asleep, and is tipsy, okay? Listen, I hey. made that character that way. It's not my fault that you all decided to go <laughs> down the same route of nonsense. Oh. <laughs> and I need to remind you that Midnight looks like um, a rainbow unicorn from um, some sort of greeting card right now. Yes, because I've got oh, all the glitter. Oh, I want to be with you. <laughs> <laughs> if, the, like if the plant monarch could, could be embarrassed, he would be. <laughs> oh, 
course, Kemka. We'll go and prepare right away. And he looks at everybody. <laughs> like, like, please, please at least leave dignified. <laughs> is is, is the, the look in his eye. <laughs> yes, yeah, fine bowels properly. It'll be an honor. <laughs> Midnight woofs like like at Vicky. <laughs> oh yes, uh, honor and stuff. Yes, uh, it, I I'm, I already said I'm in. I'm excited about this. What? <laughs> it will be at? an honor and a pleasure to strengthen our relationship with the Russian. So now we're going to move into a gather scene. Uh, this is a scene in which, uh, like the Chronicle, you have narrative control. Um, this is when you prepare everything you might need for this expedition or this quest in this case. Um, and by narrative control, you can introduce truths into the setting um, as long as it doesn't have to do with the threat. And we don't really have a threat yet. Uh, if there's something that you need, you can have it. If there's something you need to know, you can know it. Uh, no roles are necessary. This is your chance to get you all set for everything that you might need. The purpose of this design is to stop the, you know that sort of like well i'm going to roll to find out we don't need a roll to find out you either know it or you don't <laughs> and uh you can know it at this point so uh go ahead and let me know what you are going to do this is also a chance for uh the the characters to kind of come together on a plan and then um know what what you need in order to execute that plan so this is all you have fun i'm just gonna sit here and watch all right uh i guess i'll go first uh Lanatan doesn't really need a whole lot for this expedition. Most of what they would need is probably already on their person. Um, but he would go back to uh, the sort of like smaller hovel that he chooses to chooses to live in. Uh, gathers up some uh, some uh, something akin to like a walking stick because who knows how many different hills and other natural uh other topographical things that he'll have to navigate um sort of picks up off of a sort of side table with the uh, bed he sleeps on is this sort of like three ringed stone compass that acts as more of a uh spell casting focus slash spell book for him and sort of hangs it around his neck it's like, well, don't really know much about the whole spirit thing. Oh, I have to talk to Vicky. Oh, I have to talk to Vicky. And he's going to go find Vicky. <laughs> you will find her at her parents' home, which is a large tree uh, area f that is... Um, in a busier, higher up, higher end kind of place of, of uh, yeah, or the wealthier place of the settlement. Um, they have a library. They, of course, have lots and lots of information on all sorts of stuff, given how many generations the key family spans. Um, and you find her uh, going through a couple of the books and having a backpack next to her that is stuffed full of books, but all of them, as you would probably know from previous expeditions, empty because she wants to write up everything. It's always too heavy. One of you always has to carry it because she always packs more than she should. Um, and she goes through some stuff, has probably run off on 15 different tangents and is currently looking up cooking recipes of fish soup in the <laughs> Southern Pacific whatever that equivalent is in this world. Uh, Becky? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Is it time? Do we have to go? Uh, no, not yet. Um, I wanted a bit more of, uh, I guess, insight into this whole thing with spirits. If we have to harm, harm's not the right word, but if we have to deal with them, more murder. Yes. I looked that up earlier. Hold on. <laughs> and she dives into a pile of, of books. Is this like, evil? 
<laughs> it's like a Scrooge McDuck, but with books. <laughs> There's a couple of feathers flying. <laughs> how many... How many books are here? I've never counted them. I haven't read them all yet, either. Oh. And he'll just sort of pull a random one off the wall, starts flipping through it. Hmm. Don't really know much about... Oh! Okay, okay, okay. He's basically found the equivalent of, like, a Harlequin romance novel and just slides it back on the shelf oh, awkwardly. That, that was great, great grandmother. Uh, Roski, she had an interesting life. Wait, so that book was about her? Oh, yeah, that's her biography. Oh. Well, she certainly led an interesting life. Okay, spirits. We're here to talk about spirits, though. What do you know? She holds up a book. This... <laughs> what do I find in that book? In terms of actual... That is up to you. We're in a gather Ooh. scene. What do I... Oh, I thought you said that's where we're rolling for stuff. Um... Yeah, on, um, uh, yeah, in the gather scene, at this point, you can tell me. Um, I don't have any threats Whoa. in play, so you get to decide. Interesting. Okay. It, do I get to decide in terms of just everything on how it works or is it is there a background information that you have that oh you know everything I know about. at this point yeah so you're the GM mm. okay so here we have uh, the spirits um, apparently they are some of the souls that have no one to fuse with and no ancestors to go to uh because you know how we are um, actually great grandmother rosie fused with my soul i'm very proud of that but um <laughs> when when there's no family that they can go to the theory is that they become spirits and they get very lonely and angry sometimes that's it kind of awful actually oh yeah it's really sad and horrible and also so cool because if you can imagine like can because because right my soul is kind of animal as well but what if you can fuse with just souls that aren't related to you because if you fuse soul fuses with an animal but then there do they have souls even in the first place moon anyway it it takes a little bit for vicky to return to the topic um but you'll eventually hear her talk about um the idea of finding closure can take those spirits away. The idea of um, forcing them into another vessel. Mm. And the literally just eliminating them thing doesn't come up in this particular book. Hmm. They always seem to want to be connected to someone and something which is so very deeply the core of the belief of of these th those people so it kind of makes sense that that wouldn't occur to them that you can just banish right hmm interesting subject matter i'll have to figure out what magics to use accordingly then Well, sorry, go ahead. We can maybe talk to them. We can see what, why they're on the street, why they're blocking the area. We can see if they're like able to communicate and then we can tell them to go away and go haunt another place. That's how it works, yes? That sounds simple. Uh, certainly seems like it, yes. So... I shall go prepare accordingly. Um, thank you. What are you going to prepare? Um, well, I do have to switch out some of the runes that are on here, sort of gesturing to the compass. 
um, to use different magics. Uh, so it seems unfortunately the ones I will need to use aren't necessarily my strongest suit, but we'll make do. You'll be fine. You can do more murdering, I'm sure, without getting murdered yourself. Oh, f- <laughs> I'd like to try and not murder these things, but if it comes down to it, I will prepare some of those as well. Yeah, I'm not sure we can murder these things, but you might be able to murder other people on the way. <laughs> you seem too joyful about this. Well, you were all very excited about murdering earlier. I'm just trying to. <laughs> I appreciate you matching the enthusiasm. Thanks. I You're welcome. Uh, and Lonaton will sort of uh, dig around in a couple different pockets. And well, Paul was probably like a very, <laughs> at this point, probably like a stale sweet cake sort of thing and just sort of hands it to you. And she sort of glares a little with her eyes getting very small. That's actually kind of frightening. No, this is just for helping me. Can I have that in writing? Last time? Last (sighs) time you had me you had me dig through 15 chronicles for one name that was weird to pronounce. You can have that in writing, yes. As soon as Bicky already like pulled a notebook out. Yeah. <laughs> Lonaton will sort of just write that down and will sign their name. There you go. I accept your transaction. <laughs> And then she <laughs> bubbles it up. Uh, it's sort of like this uh, blueberry ish flavor to it that is also sort of like uh, it tastes a little bit like there's been some tea leaves that were mixed into whatever this was baked into. Uh, that's, pretty, that's pretty good. That was worth it. <laughs> you really I mean, lost with that bargain. That was, you should have kept that one for something for, uh. for another favor. I can always make more. You bake? On occasion, yes. Next. Starts making notes. What do you bake? When did you start baking? We can skip through that if you want. <laughs> but she, she's... What's your yeah, favorite I... thing? Who taught you to, how to bake? Is baking magic? <laughs> Some say that it is, yes. And I'm sure it's, he's giving off everything that he's like his entire life in baking. <laughs> will probably fade to the other two folks and allow them to do their thing. <laughs> yeah, what are you um what are you both doing to prepare for this expedition? I should note that the um the emissary is going to stay behind um because really not that's the purpose of her journey. Well, I think at some point Stein's going to go off and do their own thing, but at some point in the night whatever works for uh, Danny, uh, Midnight Star and Bright Sun are going to hear a knock on their door, and it's Stein. <laughs> yeah, um, Midnight went back to to, and you know the 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 Colts were asleep and whatnot, but um, you know he of course told Bright Sun you know what was going on and that he was going to have to leave. And everything and um they were making plans because it's traditional for them to like um braid things into his mane and stuff like that whenever he goes like onto a mission and stuff so they were they were um you know so he'll always have like three strands like whenever he goes and like you know from bright sun and the colts from like whenever he goes you know they do that before he leaves so you know they were kind of talking about you know well you know when should we wake the colts and stuff like that because they would be really upset like even though he has to like leave at dawn they would be really upset if they didn't do that so and he's gonna have to wake up to tell him to say goodbye and stuff anyway so that's what they're talking about when stein shows up (laughs) they kind of have like a like a homestead it's like a farm and they have a you know crops and stuff like that and their house isn't really like a house it's like a barn 
it, it's you know because mm. it's open and, and they're unicorns and stuff so you know it's kind of a big you know kind of kind of barn where there's you know and uh, you know big open space where there's like bales you know hay and stuff to lay down in and and all sorts of other things like that so yeah midnight will open the door you know we'll, we'll nudge open the door hello <laughs> hello are you prepared um yes but i want to look back at some things and see if i can remember something that might help us i see i thought you were going to apologize for giving my cold glitter crystal dust uh, did you get it out yet and he looks at his flank that is still, even though he took a bath, that is still covered. Uh, Stein just like kind of grins. And again, obviously they don't have like an actual mouth. Like there's no like, it's, you know, it's the surface approximation of, you know, facial features. So when Stein grins, they have like, teeth made of the same stone as the rest of their body with maybe some like crystal or metal in there um and you know a little bit of a glow uh from you know their mouth when they make noise <laughs> um and immediately like all the dust starts like falling off uh, and out of uh midnight's coat and then like in a little wisp of glitter it just goes out the door back behind <laughs> into the grass thank you you're welcome. I won't apologize, though. It's funny. <laughs> Little and Biddle liked it, and Midnight Sun was, thought it was funny. He was trying not to laugh, but he thought it was funny. I know. We discussed it. Please, commit. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Stein uh, steps in, and since Stein doesn't, so Stein does not have a home. Uh, at least here in the city, um, being that they don't need shelter and they don't need like food or sustenance or anything else to survive. They just literally don't have like an abode. I'm sure they've like, maybe the city's tried to give them one at some point and they just never used it. So somebody else got it. Um, but when Stein goes and does their memory, you know, going back to their memories, it does leave them like fairly vulnerable like they need some sort of you know outside stimulus like you know it's almost as if you're waking somebody up mm -hmm. um maybe a little bit deeper i imagine like a good deep sleep so whenever stein needs to or wants to you know kind of check their memories for something um they prefer to be somewhere safe you know it's not something that they can do like out in the open or by themselves um unless you know they because that leaves them vulnerable. So I imagine this is not the first time that Stein has just like come over to do this. So I imagine Midnight would and Bright Sun would know exactly what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so before this, I'm sure Stein would have probably gone and talked to some of the scouts and maybe some of the Russian people to get like a, you know, a good general idea of where on like a map or, um, you know, like a geographical map where this problem was. Uh, so what I would like to do if possible is Stein is going to look back into their memories and see if they know of a city or a town or some other um, population center that maybe was in this region back before the fall, if they've been there. Um, you know, obviously the, to remember it, they would have had to be there, but they're going to check. Yeah, uh, you have narrative control. So if you want that to be true, it is. Okay. So, um, you know, Stein will probably just go to the usual area that he always does this. Um, I imagine he faces the wall because probably the first time he did this, like both Midnight Star and Bright Sun were like, this is creepy can you not like stare into the rest of our house <laughs> like you know can you not <laughs> like your eyes are following us around the room so basically like stein goes and either sits in a corner or like faces the corner and stands there um and looking back in their memories they kind of 
um, have to go through it almost like you would files. Um, you know, occasionally they have to like stop and be like, okay, this is too soon, this is too far. Um, and it's a very time consuming process. Uh, and at some point they find um, what they're looking for, at least the right time period. So uh, before the fall in this region um, off the main road, uh, there used to be a um, decently sized town, like maybe just big enough to have like, you know, palisade walls or something, maybe like, you know, almost a thousand people. Um, and, you know, a regional farming town, you know, the kind of place that would be the center of commerce or the center of, um, you know, a large farming or uh large farming community or something like that um and they don't have any memories of what happened to the town they weren't there when that happened but they do specifically have you know like they traveled through it at some point um in their lifetime and it's just a very typical town there's nothing particularly special about it that uh stein remembers um just you know friendly people um, you know, part of the uh, empire, you know, fairly loyal citizens, fairly, you know, cosmopolitan, um, but simple folk, you know, not a very, the town is maybe mostly made of wood and stone. Um, and it would have been on what used to be the main highway. Um, back in the empire, but I imagine, you know, the trade route is probably made through whatever is currently the easiest route, and it's no longer what the highway used to be. Um, so after, you know, a few hours, um, Stein would kind of wake back up um, and, you know, have this memory of, you know, the basics of the town uh, nearby in this region um as an idea of where this haunting pot could potentially be coming from what was the name of the town uh silvervale so this is why everybody should buy this game because they don't have to do any gming you just <laughs> you just write down what everybody i just saying. write down what everybody says <laughs> Uh, Silver Bear, very nice. And what's that person's name, right? Yes. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, what is uh, uh, so? Well, Midnight Star is basically going to wait the cults up, right, and get the the bride yeah, and say and his goodbyes. Yeah, they're traditional, you know. And of course, Stein's there while this goes on. You know, Midnight Star sort of, you know, kneels down and and bright sun and the cults. They, you know, put the little you know, beads in his hair and stuff. And I mean, imagine at this point, you know, light starting to, you know, rise and, and we're going to have to get ready to go soon. And, you know, he, he, you know, make sure he has his spear and, and, uh, you know, his, his, you know, armor and get up and everything. And right. Some puts, you know, food and stuff in the, in the bags and everything. And, and then he nuzzles everybody and, and kind of looks at Stein, you know, like, you know, we're ready. Are we ready? You're Stein's probably waiting outside, like letting y'all have your family time. Like mm -hmm. after, after he did his thing or they did their thing, um, they kind of just let themselves out and just waited outside. Um, Cause again, Stein doesn't sleep. So anybody walking by would have just seen Stein standing there just like, waiting <laughs> like well, they can just patiently wait and so eventually when midnight comes out he's just standing outside their front door cool yeah then that's what you know midnight comes out and kind of nods and and starts walking towards where they plan to meet uh lanatan and, and vicky yeah vicky just left with mom <laughs> we're going to take care of some ghosts in a nearby town to preserve the diplomatic relationships between Staraborn and therician all right, have fun, dear. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and then she's off. <laughs> yeah. I like to imagine Lanaton was still there for that. So whenever <laughs> it's a whole family of 
of them. Whatever, oh, no. Bicky just goes like, that's <laughs> nice, dear. Have fun. He's just like in his head. And Bicky could probably see it on his face. It's just like, oh, they're all like this. <laughs> <laughs> they they are, yes. In fact, many of them are worse than her because they're artists. Worse. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, <sighs> the, those that survive the night um, are there to see the heroes off in the morning. Um, there are a few of Hoot Jedu. Looking who, wrecked. Who <laughs> <woke up>. over. <laughs> the, um... <laughs> Every expedition is a really big deal to the city because it's very isolated and it's hard to get places. So, you know, there is some pomp and circumstance around it and uh, they, you know, that some of them do attend. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, the uh, the Kim Ka has to get up and, and, you know, recite whatever verses he needs to to protect you. And, um, and then you're off. Your uh, first... Uh, the first terrain you need to go through are the, is the lower forests, and the the it's a really treacherous area, and and it's one of the reasons why the um, the the city is so well protected and isolated. the The forest ground is made of very loose soil, and um, it's all sedimentary and kind of fragile. And this is a rainforest, so it's constantly like caving in. Um, there are entire cave networks underneath the ground. Um, some of them are just open up and some of them are just barely, you know, just a bit of surface terrain before it collapses in. And these cave networks are mostly full of water. Um, and so it's real, real treacherous and you have to watch your foot, you know, you have to watch your footing. You have to make sure you're not going to actually stumble into one of these caves or you have to make sure that the terrain is solid so that you don't like crumble through. Um, but there's also, uh, the, the Sobek creature lives in these caves and that is, um, a blessing for Kim because it, you can have all these monster stories that keep people out of the city. Uh, but it also does actually exist. So you don't really want to, um, find one. <laughs> they are, uh, very dangerous and they live in these caves. So that's the terrain you're up against that you have to get through. Um, beyond that, you'll need to uh, cross a bunch of the chasms. Uh, the the um, there's a huge river network and a delta system, and then beyond that, you'll be in the marches and things will be easier. But you know, there's a reason this area is isolated. It's not easy. It's big forest terrain, lots of holes, and and you know, large crocodilian monsters. But you're heroes. It's nothing you've ever, you know, I've never had to deal with before. I usually just fly over them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd imagine Midnight would kind of be out front, you know, that would, you know, in case anything, you know, be out front in case anything jumped out or there's anything he needs to warn anybody about, you know. That's what I picture anyway. Yeah. And, and, and Stein, you're pretty used to this terrain, right? I mean, because you're always hunting in it. Yeah, so um, Stein being a wild kin um, is very familiar with at least the immediate area around, uh, you know, the Sturborn uh, lands. Um, you know, they're always traveling through here. They're always uh, scouting and hunting. And... Uh, one of their things is that they, they, you know, no one understand how to get through this environment as one of their disciplines of marching. Um, so definitely Stein would be at least um, keeping an eye on the ground, trying to lead the group to the less treacherous areas where the footing is better or, you know, being like, hey, don't step there. That's loose. That'll collapse. Like, let's go over here. Um and, you know, if necessary, if there's a place that's, like, particularly bad, you know, maybe kind of clear a path a little bit, it would take time. Um, but if we were going for, you know, slow but steady, then um, using their uh, earth and touch abilities to kind of mold some of the more dangerous bits out of the way if there's, you know, a blockage or something needs to be filled in. Vicky's also basically... Uh, recon, air recon, 
So in terms of paths, in terms of finding ways to go, she can help. And she does get more serious as soon as you leave the safe area and, you know, helps out and does her job because reasons of not dying. <laughs> All right, um, I've added a threat to the table called um, You Are Being Hunted. I try to show the uh, viewers, but there's a bug. So, um, But anyway, imagine an index card on the table that says You Are Being Hunted. Good. Um, you're going through the forest, very treacherous. Uh, between Midnight Star and Stein, you're kind of finding your way through. I mean, this is your home. Uh, you know, otherwise this would be much more difficult. Um, but you've reached a point and where uh, the cave system has been completely breached. And so there is no surface terrain in the immediate area. Basically, you've come to a cliff and beneath is uh, the open sores of a huge cave network. Um, it's actually rather beautiful. There's some waterfalls pouring into it. Um, lots of vegetation has grown. Uh, there's there's sort of a, the lapping waves of the subterranean lakes. And there's this big, beautiful cherry tree in the middle of it all that's just catching the light just right with all these cherry blossoms. Uh, but you do know this is where the Sobek are. Um, and you also know that the Sobek has spotted you. You're, 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 you're smart enough, you're good enough to know that that danger is, is here. You kind of feel the unsettling, uh, if you have a stomach, you feel the unsettling <laughs> Uh, aches in the stomach you can feel the perception of the predator somewhere in that cave network the biggest problem is, is there's no easy way around you'll have to kind of go along this breached surface for you don't know how many miles to get around this so the best way th over is through and so you're going to have to make a choice if you want to uh, try to circumnavigate this or if you want to go through and, and you also are well aware that there are Sobek out there. Um, I think probably all of you have come into contact with the Sobek once or twice before, and they're essentially crocodilian monsters. Um, they are ravenous, they're predators, they will eat and kill you. Mm. What do you do? <laughs> so, random question. Um, with Holt being a stone person, do the Sobek clock or with stein being you know a holt um do the sobek clock them as a threat i mean they move around and they make noise and all that but is that something that like they would have dealt with before with the sobek of like for them at least being easier to sneak around them or they're less you know they're not seen as a meal like how would that work yeah you're not prey but you can be a threat okay that makes sense. The rest of you all, delicious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've, I've seen videos of crocodiles taking out horses. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. In the turn of events, I've eaten crocodile before. Ooh. I've had crocodile too. sausage. I, I lived in Louisiana for a long time. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, what was... Um, well, Stein is perfectly comfortable with caves, so to them, going through the caves is the easiest and quickest thing, but it's also up to what the group is comfortable with. Yeah, I think Midnight would would do either, but he's concerned about the other two. He's concerned about Bicky and, and Anakin. Yeah, Bicky, her advantage is being able to fly. And that yeah. doesn't work in a cave. Yeah. So. so, yeah, Midnight isn't necessarily worried about, you know, uh, Stein or himself. Um, he's more worried about, you know, Bicky being being so little and Lanikin being, you know, well, meat. You know, a lot of meat. Or small meat. <laughs> uh, so he would kind of, he would kind of defer, I guess, and ask, and ask them. You know, well, what are you most comfortable with? Um, I'm not sure if this is an appropriate moment or if that if we're still in a chapter where roles aren't a thing. But the discipline of song, the counter, recount a legend, poem, or historical fact that will assist in the situation. 
Is yeah, something definitely. I can apply here? Yeah, I, I should have told you we're in a quest scene now, which means all rules are normal. Sweet. Um, then I would like to remember a fact. I have one in mind, but I'll roll first to see if that works. Yeah, that sounds great. So you're rolling uh, to, to find something in legend that would help you navigate the situation. Mm -hmm. You're confronting, you are being hunted. Um, and the... I, I think the uh, the goal here is to defend yourselves, right? Uh, my idea would be something to keep them at bay. Mm -hmm. Almost like a repellent. So it's almost actually, it would be the same stat. It's almost enforce your will in that case. Mm -hmm. But it's the same stat. So you're going to be rolling courage. This is our first roll, probably Yay. looking at the timer. Uh, you know, we're <laughs> finally getting to a roll. Um, so what you're doing is you're building a pool of of, of dice, and you, the highest and the number will be the highest die number in that pool will be your bonus to the twenty sided roll. So this nice. is a pool of modifier dice. So to start with the courage die. The courage die is a d6 for me. Yeah, and then you also get a discipline die. Um, you know you can choose if you want to spend the four, the six, or the eight, depending on how serious you you know how how much how big the chance you want to succeed is. If it's um. Uh, you, you don't get these recuperated until you rest. Mm -hmm. I see. I'll I'll go with V8 for this one. All right. And then um, if there's a talent that applies, mm -hmm. you can use... Long a... history, talent die when, lore to confront, when I use lore to confront a threat. Great. So you get a D6 as well. Another D6. Yeah, I think that's it. There's really no advantage yeah. at this point. So um, I... I, I if I were mean, I'd make you roll at a disadvantage because you can't really see what they are, but I'm not mean. Um, and I'm not sure that applies, but if there was a disadvantage, that's how it would come in at this point. All mm -hmm. right, so go ahead and roll the uh, modifier pool and then take the highest number. So that is, yeah, one of them is a six, a five, right. and the DH is also a five. All right, so you got a six plus a 20-sided roll, and that'll be your, you're trying to get okay. a 10 or better. Is a nine rolled plus the six, so fifteen. Okay, cool. So the spectrum of success is zero to nine is a miss, and uh, uh, the ten to nineteen is a um, complication. So um, the lower you have, I, I I should have narrative control here, but you said you have an idea, so I want to hear it. Um, yeah, an idea would be that uh, Vicky has read or encountered something before or maybe there's even a children's rhyme i quite like that idea about when you went when venture into the wood uh, this is all the dangerous stuff that will kill you um and but one of them is to keep i think a scent a special scent uh, can keep the sobex at bay um i don't want to say it automatically makes them run away because that's boring but you know it's it's it makes them think twice about attacking you and gives you a little bit more security, a little bit more um, of a chance to see them coming or to run away. Something like that. You muted. You muted, Chris. And we... <laughs> we we still can't hear you. How about now? Yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, there it is. <laughs> there we All go. right, I said some really awesome things too. Wow. So now you get the B version of what I said. <laughs> oh. Um. So the the florals. Uh, I guess it'll be a floral scent. Um, yeah, because there's lots of florals around here. Incredibly stinky and smelly that nobody likes to get on them, and you really have to lather up. Oh, it could be like the pine sap. Oh, Ooh, God. Yeah. It's got glitter out of my hide. Like, what? <laughs> I'm so sorry. So that'll keep um, them at bay. Uh, uh, and uh, and so you'll, you'll, put, you'll put all the sap on you, and you're going to go in? Is that the plan? Well, do we have those resources around us? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, gotcha. I was going to be like, well, I could use magic to just make us smell like pine sap. Yeah. <laughs> No, you're in a you're in a forest. It's um, 
readily available. And I think the reason that it, yes. they deter it is because they, um, I don't know, maybe it's a, maybe it's an irritant for them. They're yeah. allergic. Yeah. They're allergic crocodiles. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, you sap up, it's sticky, it's stinky. <laughs> it takes a while. Lonaton hates this. And you can see ripples in the water as some of them are scurrying away as you are sapping up. The scent is too strong for them. Um, and well, the th it actually it makes uh, makes Vicky look like uh, it accentuates the colors in her feathers. Like she's the only one that benefits from this. <laughs> Everybody else is sort of you know sticky and gross looking. Sun is completely unfazed by the smell. They're aware of it, but they just they don't clock it as smelling particularly bad. And so you get into the cave, um, and the cave system is actually kind of lit because a lot of the surface has collapsed throughout. Um, and you're you're um, wading through water. The complication from this role is the fact that you have got to go through a nest of these things. Good. There are probably, the first thing that you find is like, you know, sort of this slimy uh, outcrop of the cave that's just above the water. And there are, um, you can't even see it because of the darkness and the shadows, but things are like slipping off into the water and huge things. And as you get in closer, you can see that there are probably a dozen very large crocodilians all around you and they're just waiting for a moment the water is getting deeper and so at some point you've only you've only got a little bit of time before the water starts um, washing off the scent can stein make like a sort of a stone bridge to keep us out of the deeper parts of the water or some way to keep us like from really sinking in. Yes. Um, the conflict is that you are in a nest. So at this point, I think you are trying to defend the group, right? To protect them from getting eaten. Yes, like keep us out of, yeah, like keeping us out of the deeper water. So one, it keeps us from getting washed off and two, keeps it from where it's harder for them to sneak up on us in the deeper water. All right. So you're going to be rolling um, virtue. Okay. And then if you can add a discipline, is there a discipline mm -hmm. that describes mm -hmm. this? Uh, yes. So... I have, so I don't know if which one would fit, um, but I have Marchin, uh, know and understand how to get through an environment, or Junta, uh, know and understand how to track, capture, or kill a creature. I think it's um, Marchin in this case, okay. as you know, you're working with the environment to get through. So choose which die you would like to add to your pool from that, four, six, or eight. Okay, uh, for this one, I will use the eight. Then is there a talent that you can add to this? Mm -hmm. So I do get a talent die when I'm confronting threats in a forest, but we are in a cave. Yeah, so, not quite. Yeah, not quite. On the, or on the, on the border, but yeah. All right, so, yeah. Um, so you're just rolling the uh, discipline die and the humor die, which is your virtue. Okay, and the heritage ability doesn't add anything to that? Um. What is the ability? Because that's what the earthen touch. It's how it, that's how um, Stein manipulates earth and stone. Yeah, that's uh, that's just something you can naturally do. Okay. But it's not going to add anything to the pool unless it explicitly says so. So in this case, I'm rolling two d8s. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So that's an eight and a six for a total of fourteen. Okay. So, eight, uh, so you rolled a um, you rolled on the twenty. Oh, you pick the highest number from the pool and then you add it to a twenty sided die roll. Oh, for oh, okay, twenty sided die roll. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I thought it was two d eights because I was doing virtue. Yeah. 
Okay, so that's an eight and then a fourteen, so twenty-two. All right, so that's a that's a good success. Um, this also means you can in- introduce a truth, and um, you gain a favor. So okay. Another favor. So um, what that means is you can describe what happens and how it works, and the outcome of the situation. Um, so yeah, I think. Uh... Stein would have to focus a lot. So probably let, you know, the rest of the party to, you know, keep an eye out for them as they do this. And even though it seems like so as as Stein takes the lead, they notice they start to um, stop going down deeper into the water, but start going further up. Um, until, you know, the water is maybe just like at their ankles or their knees. Um, you know, they're whatever keeps them from getting washed off. Stein's not going to do it all the way because that would take too much, uh, focus and time. They're just doing like what the minimum is to make it work. Um, and so as everybody kind of just follows behind Stein, uh, we're able to get to the other side of this pool, um, without getting into the deep water. And so the the stinky sap stuff doesn't wash off as much as it could have. And you can hear the lashing in the pool and the growls as you still don't see them because they're keeping hidden, keeping hidden. But they are um, at bay, and they seem to be kind of anxious and angry about it. But they're not going to they're not going to come in close. It's, too, it's just too stinky. So you get across um, this subterranean lake, and um, there is just darkness beyond. Now you realize you are in the cave system. So there's that nest back there that you just passed, um, but there was there was you know a way up as some of the earth had collapsed beneath and um, opened up. But now you are sort of in a deeper, darker area, and there is no daylight anywhere to be found. Um, I'm guessing that Stein can see in the dark. And uh, Bicky? Yeah, I took uh, that. And you, you don't really see um, cave walls on the other side. <laughs> it's just it's this vast subterranean chamber. But there's more water. Um, it's kind of, kind of in and out. And, and actually, if you look closer with your night vision, you can see that there is another deep lake beyond This is a lot bigger than I thought it is. Yeah. It's going to be very easy to get lost in there. Do you think we want light? Should I make one? Because I'm not seeing shit right now, if I'm being honest. I mean, it would be helpful if everybody could see. Okay, well, and he'll press, uh, it's like a couple different runes that are on the, uh, compass that he has, and he will attempt to create a light. I'm not sure if there will be a roll involved with that, or... Not in this case, that's just something you can do. Okay. Rolls, just so you know, rolls happen when you're trying to affect the fiction. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, only when you're trying to affect the fiction drastically. Right. Okay. And you see the uh, crystal that's in the circle in his head sort of starts to give off this basically like torchlight level of light and turns this brighter shade of white better. Well, you don't really have a chance to say better or sigh because as soon as the light is up, something is jumping out of the water. Good. Um, I think uh, Stein and Bicky, you you saw it first. Like the water sort of parts and there is this large beast just rising up. The beast is uh, really all teeth. That's all you can see from your point of view. It's, it's probably the size of, well, I don't know. Let's just put dimensions on it. It's like five feet of teeth jumping out and is coming at 
at you as a strike. Um, now this is probably one of these Sobek, but this one is completely white and colorless. It is um, also, not that you have a lot of chance to look at it closely, but it's very scarred. Uh, it seems to be missing an eye. It's really ragged. It looks like it has a spear sticking out of its side. And it's trying to eat you all. It probably could. I get to definitely swallow Midnight Star whole. Oh, oh that's just cheery. Nice. Uh, speaking of, can, <laughs> Minister sees this thing. Can I? Can I? Can he whip out his his spear from his you know his thing and and you know chuck it at this thing? Uh, yeah. Can you say that one more time? You're getting a little quiet. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, can I, I want to use my, uh, sword or, uh, no, the, um, the archer, the discipline of archery mm -hmm. yeah. and use my spear and my holder to, you know, telekinetically just, just launch the spear at it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so I think this is strike, which is a courage roll. Mm -hmm. Resolve a conflict using combat. That sounds right. Yep, and that's my eight guy. And then your archery discipline? Yeah, and I'm going to use... Uh, I don't know if I want to use one. Uh, I'll use my six for it. And I do have... Um, whenever your understanding of battle strategy and tactics will help my situation, he wants to, you know, place it like where it's going to do the most damage. Through the brain. Um, you put one in the brain, the brain, then we're done. Yeah. <laughs> and we go home. Right. Exactly. Easy. All right. So I roll the, the D8 and the D6. Yep. And then also your courage. Okay. Whatever that, whatever die that is. Uh, yeah, actually, it's the D eight. I took a D six for the archery. Okay. And then I'll do a D D six for this. So I rolled a a six on my courage. Okay. And then I rolled two and two on the six siders. So six, seven, eight, ten. Oh, don't add them together. You're taking the highest one. Oh, ten, then be six. Six, and then add that to the twenty sided roll. Twelve, so eighteen. Okay. So far, so good. So uh, the spear just kind of launches in through its mouth into its skull and out the other side, and it just writhes around. Now it has two spears in it. Um, the goal was to kill in one shot, though, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Kill it as quickly as possible. For sure. Yeah, so um, it it writhes around and splashes and knocks, uh, uh, actually probably knocks you all down from the impact. But now it's uh, crawling back into the water slowly and is disappearing with your spear. <laughs> oh, dang. All right. I didn't think we'd have to kill things this quickly. And he'll press... A couple different uh runes on this compass and he sort of watches what just seems like this sort of like bubble of air will just sort of launch itself at the uh at this large crocodile thing as it's trying to go back into the water like imagine this like uh you know those like shrimp that'll like punch something really quick with like a bubble of water mm -hmm. it kind of looks like that but with air and it's um well it's it's probably dying on its way out. Are you just trying to finish it off? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and why are you trying to do that? Do you want to get to help get the spear back? Yeah. Okay, so this so. is virtue. Boy, that's my D four. <laughs> um, I think in terms, well, let's see, in terms of discipline, this would definitely be. I think it'd be sage, I think. Use a tone to perform a ritual for a magical effect that harms or protects from harm. Because I'm yeah. trying to kill this thing. Yeah, right. So, right. Uh I'll use I'll use my D6 for this. So let's roll these two. 
Okay, that's a five on the D6, so we're going to use that. And then the D20 roll. That is a 12, so 17. Okay. So the um, the effect does work, and this is a uh, it, it's sort of like an air bubble, right? Yeah. So there's just the graphic results of that, you know, just sort of like, <laughs> and it it its head explodes essentially from the impact. And it's toppled around, and there is um, you know, the spear is is there and and grabbable. You're just going to have to swim out to go get it. Uh, I don't like or fly it. over or get to it, but it's like. You know. He's telekinetic, so he's just going to telekinetic oh, it's gonna... back to himself. Go right back into your... Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, that is what's out there uh, if you continue along this way. That's just fun, isn't it? I mean, I thought it was exciting. <laughs> yeah. Midnight just looks at you all like you're off your rockers. <laughs> He has been hiding behind Stein. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not going to eat me. Yeah, that's why I'm using you as a shield. Oh, <laughs> uh, all right. Well, we still want to take the quickest way, folks. Might as well. All right. I um, forgot about something in there. That's all right. Too late. It's fine. <laughs> I'm. We're here. We might as well keep going. I mean, unless you want to go back through that room that we just came through. No, no, we'll be fine. <laughs> okay, so the heroes are going to pursue uh, the darkness. And our yes. closing we shot is the, the four of you from behind as you're going into the water. Um, <laughs> the uh, corpse of a of a Sobek next to you. All right. Well, I think that's probably a good place to stop. I know we had a kind of a weird schedule today. I want to make sure you all have time to go to the next game. <laughs> all the other stuff. I have another game, too, with the middle schoolers. Woo! I have another that's game, fun. too. We're doing vampires. So. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> I've got... I've got to run D and D tonight. Yay. Yay! I'll be there. Yeah. I am glad that we got to uh, use the dice a bit, so we can kind of see how <laughs> that works. Right at the end. <laughs> <laughs> right at the end. So, uh, thank you for tuning in. We are planning on coming back, but on Sunday, uh, the week after. Wait, two weeks after tomorrow. Yeah. We're in a two-week so cycle. The... Yep. So, um, those of you that are mothers, happy Mother's Day at least in the U.S. Uh, those that, of you that aren't, be sure to wish your mothers happy Mother's Day. And uh, thank you for tuning in. I'm going to turn off the stream now, and we will see you next time. Ooh, bye-bye.